I'm Anna Furman, and I am owner of Proper Topper, and we are just absolutely thrilled to have you guys join us tonight. And I'm so pleased that we are talking about this beautiful book, Liberty, and that we have Caitlin Greenidge here with us to discuss it. I'm really honored that she has been able to join us, along with Anna Kaskin, who I don't think is on the call yet, but will be here shortly. And she's our friend and distinguished doctor who has uh, agreed to be co-host for the evening and will lead the discussion with Caitlin. Um, Sorry, one second. Okay, going to dive right in here. We have just absolutely loved having this platform of our Proper Chopper Book Club over the last year to be a way that we can stay in touch with our community and deepen our ties with um, our friends and the fellow readers who we love. And it is really fitting that this book is coming to us this month. It feels like it's just full of so many issues and important things that we all have been thinking about and would love to talk about. I have a few, and, and to those of you who've been with us every month, thank you so much. And to those of you who are new, welcome. I have a few notes that I wanted to cover first. Um, many of you have already purchased this book. I'm gonna hold it up again, it's such a beautiful cover. Many of you have already purchased it from us. Uh, but for those of you who haven't purchased it yet or those who've already bought it and want to buy another one for a friend, it's a great gift, you can buy it on our website. And I also wanted to make sure that you know that we're giving 100% of the sales of the book to um, Project Hope for the Haitian relief efforts that they are making. Um, so our conversation tonight will run for about for 40 minutes. I encourage you all to submit questions, comments in the in the chat, I'm sorry. Yes, in the chat section of your screen. So, sorry, I'm now confusing you, but you put it into the chat section and I'm emphasizing that because we've had people send emails and texts in the past and we can't sort of navigate all of that. It needs to be in the chat. Um, and we will then present those questions and comments to the author and to the doctor at about 20 minutes in. Um, so, with no further ado, I was going to say that I'm going to introduce Anna, but I don't see her on the call yet. Anna, are you here? No, not here yet. Um, so, I will introduce Anna when she jumps onto the call, but for now, I will go ahead and introduce Caitlin. Caitlin Greenidge is the author of this beautiful book. It's her second novel. Um, and I have a lot of things to say about you, Kaylin, except Anna was gonna introduce you, so she's actually practiced. <laughs> uh, but I know she's gonna introduce you when she gets here because she'll do a better job, but we were gonna start with the reading. So maybe we can go ahead and start with that. And then Anna will join us when she has mastered the technology that we all struggle with. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm really excited to join everybody tonight. Um, so I'm gonna read from um, Liberty, um, which as some of you may know, it's a novel about a woman, it's, it's based on the life story of the first black female doctor in New York State, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, um, who had a daughter named Anna who married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti. So the novel is very loosely um, based on their lives. Um, and it scans, starts um, just before the Civil War in 1859, and it lasts through um, the beginnings of reconstruction in this country and then moves on to Haiti. So I'm gonna, <coughs> excuse me, read from the first couple pages of the book, which is when Liberty is about um, uh, seven or eight years old, um, and it's 1859, and um, she's living with her mother in a community of, of free Black people in Brooklyn. Um, which her grandfather, her mother's father, helped found. Um, so I'm just going to read the first opening pages of Liberty. <clears throat> I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. It still didn't help him much, my love, she told me, but I saw her do it all the same. That's how I knew she was magic. The time I, say, I saw Mama raise a man from the dead, it was close to dusk. 
Mama and her nurse Lenora were in her office, Mama with her little greasy glasses on the tip of her nose, balancing the books, and Lenora banking the fire. That was the rule in Mama's office. The fire was kept burning from dawn till after dinner, and we never let it go out completely. Even on the hottest days, when my linen collar stuck to the back of my neck and the belly of Lenore's apron was stained with sweat, a mess of logs and twigs was lit up down there, waiting. When the dead man came, it was spring. I was playing on the stoop. I'd broken a stick off the mulberry bush, so young it had resisted the pull of my fist. I'd had to work for it. Once I'd wrenched it off, I stripped the bark and rubbed the wet wood underneath on the flagstone, pressing the green into rock. I heard a rumbling come close and looked up and I could see down the road a mule plodding slow and steady with a covered wagon, a ribbon of dust trailing behind it. In those days, the road to our house was narrow and only just cut through the brush. Our house was set back. Grandfather, my mother's father, had made his money raising pigs and kept the house and pens away from everyone else to protect his neighbors and his reputation from the undermining smell of swine. No one respects a man, no matter how rich and distinguished looking, who stinks of pig scat. The house was set up on a rise so we could always see who was coming. Usually it was mama's patients walking or limping or running to her office. Wagons were rare. When it first turned down our road, the cart was moving slowly, but once it passed the bowed over walnut tree, the woman at the seat snapped her whip and the mule began to move a little faster until it was upon us. Where's your mother? I opened my mouth, but before I could call for her, my mother rushed to the door, Lenore behind her. Quick was all Mama said, and the woman came down off the seat. A boy, about 12 or 13, followed. They were both dressed in mourning clothes. The woman's skirt was full. Embroidered on the bodice of her dress were a dozen black lilies done in cord. The boy's mourning suit was dusty, but perfectly fit to his form. At his neck was a velvet bow tie come undone on the journey. The woman carried an enormous beaded handbag. It too was dusty, but looked rich. It was covered in a thousand little eyes of jet that winked at me in the last bit of sun. Go, Lenore, my mother said, and Lenore and the woman and the boy all went to the back of the wagon, the boy hopping up in the bed and pushing something that lay there, Lenore and the woman standing, arms ready to catch it. Finally, after much scraping, a coffin heaved out of the wagon bed. It was crudely made, a white, bright wood, heavy enough that Lenore and the woman stumbled as they carried it. When the coffin passed me, I could smell the sawdust still on it. My mother stepped down off the stoop then, and the four of them lifted it up and managed to make it into the office. As soon as they got it inside, they set it on the ground and pushed it home. I could hear the rough pine shuffling across the floor. You're early, Mama struggled with the box. Don't start with me, Kathy, the woman said, and Lenora looked up, and so did I. No one, except Grandfather before he died, dared call Mama Kathy to everyone, except for me, she was always doctor. But Mama did not bristle and did not correct as she would have with anyone else. Word was you'd be here at midnight. We couldn't leave, the woman said. He wasn't ready. The woman knelt down in her dusty skirts and drew a long, skinny claw hammer from the handbag. She turned it on its head and began to pull at the nails on the coffin's face. She grunted. Here, Lucien, she signaled at the boy. Put some grease into it. He fell beside her, took the hammer from her hands, and began to pull at the nails she left behind. Mama watched eagerly. We all did. I crossed the room to stand beside her, slipped my hand into hers. Mama started at my touch. If only you'd come later. The woman's head jerked up, her expression sharp, and then she looked at my hand in Mama's and her frown softened. I know we've done it differently. This time we really tried, she said. Besides, my Lucien sees all this and more. If you do this work, Kathy, your children will know sooner or later. I'll stop there. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Is Anna Furman trying to talk? There I am. Okay. Oh, there you are. <laughs> so sorry. That is such an incredibly powerful opening, and it's amazing to hear it in your voice. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. And so now Anna, the other Anna, is here and has joined us. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Um, um, and I, I didn't make my introduction of you yet, so I'm going to back up and do that and then let you make the formal introduction, if that works for you, of Caitlin, because I just sure. made a part right now. Sounds good. 
find now out all of her fabulous credentials. So Dr. Anna Kaskin, I first met um, through an organization that she co-founded called Baby Love DC. Um, and that was when I first met Anna. And that was through a mutual friend of ours. So I'm just going to give a little quick shout out to our friend Annie Lou, because I know she would love, she would be all about this book and this event. Um, so Anna is a pediatrician. She is associate director of MedStar Georgetown University Pedia uh, Community Pediatrics. She is also through that the medical director. Uh, now I'm going to have to refer to my notes. I thought I knew all this by heart, but she's got a lot to speak about here. She is associate director of community. Of, uh, sorry, she is medical director of school-based health, which has got to be a huge, huge project right now. Mm -hmm. And she's deputy director of the Georgetown University Health Justice Alliance. Her areas of interest include health disparities, childhood trauma, and medical legal partnerships. She's a graduate of the National Cathedral School, which is close to our hearts here. And she earned her BA and MD from the University of Virginia. So. Well, thank you. That's Dr. Anna. Thank and you Dr. so much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Proper Topper, for hosting this, this little evening together. And for Caitlin, I assume that you are out of town. Maybe you haven't had a chance to stop into Proper Topper. Um, and any of, our, any of our guests who haven't been there, it's an experience. It is it's retail therapy, but you don't even have to buy anything to get the therapy because it's such an amazing um, environment. So one of my favorite places to go, whether I'm buying or not. Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Caitlin, for joining us. And I'm sorry for my second strike tonight of being late to a meeting and not actually getting to meet you in the way we thought it would unfold. So um, I appreciate <laughs> you for joining us tonight. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bio on Caitlin. Caitlin was born in Boston and raised also in Massachusetts. She attended Wesleyan University, um, got her MFA at Hunter College, and her debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, um, was published in 2016 and was very well received. It was on the uh, finalist list for the New York Times Critics' Choice for 2016, a, a finalist for the New York Public Library's Young Lions Award, and on the short list for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Uh, Caitlin is a, a contributing editor um, and opinion writer for the New York Times. Um, she has been published in Vogue, Elle, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. And she is also um, on the staff of Harper's Bazaar. She's a features features director at Harper's Bazaar. Um, so thank you so much. And I love that when we asked you to pick a passage to read tonight, you picked the very beginning because that was my sort of, one of the biggest things that sort of came out of the book for me was that it opened with a bang. It opened <laughs> with a lot. And the first chapter is so chock full of stuff and I wrote down, as I was reading, I wrote down a little list of what was in the first chapter. For me. So life and death, mm -hmm. race, color, freedom, slavery, running from, running to, rich and poor, higher status, lower status. <laughs> so it just like had so much in it. And I was wondering how it came to be that way. And I don't never written a novel. I've written some very, very short little writings. Um, but I wondered, did it just come out of you like that? You picked up a pen and it you just disgorged what was in your brain? Or did you rewrite that part over and over? Like, how did that, how did that chapter? Um, so I, had first heard the story of um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart and her daughter Anna when I was working for a Black History Museum called the Weeksville Heritage Center that's in um, located in central Brooklyn. And um, I was working on their oral history project and we were um, interviewing 
uh, descendants of people who had lived in Weeksville in the 19th century. And so I talked to um, Anna's granddaughter, so um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart's great granddaughter, um, who was this really wonderful um, soap opera actress. She told this really captivating story about her her ancestors and this uh, ancestor she had who traveled to Haiti, got into this marriage that didn't go very well, um, asked her mother to come and help her get her out of it. And the mother actually miraculously was sort of able to help her um, get out of this abusive marriage. And I was so taken with that story. And just it, as I was researching more and more, there were all these different layers around it. Um, when I spoke with um, Ellen Holly, the, the descendant of these people, she had really framed it as a story around um, the pitfalls and sort of perils of Black excellence. You know, she was talking about her family in terms of, um, and, and she was a, a wonderful genealog genealogist, so she knew the history of her family in terms of, um, uh, you know, they were always first. I think her, you know, her grandfather founded this town, her, uh, or her, one of her ancestors found this town, another ancestor was the first Black female doctor in New York State, another ancestor was the first engineer. She sort of grown, grew up in this family of what today we would term as Black excellence, and yet she was really clear about the emotional toll that that took on, on their family life um, and the um, compromises that they had to continually make generation after generation to sort of live in this uh, upper class existence, this sort of very rarefied existence. So I was really struck by that with around class and then of course um, around color as I was sort of reading more and more, I got really interested in this question of how to portray um, colorism as it would have been experienced in this particular period in Reconstruction. And then I got really interested in sort of thinking about um, this question of medicine and healing because it was gonna be a story about a doctor, or there would be a doctor character in the story. And I started sort of thinking more deeply about what um, health and healing and uh, medicine looks like um, on a community basis. So all of those things look very different from community to community, um, especially when you're talking about in the 19th century, sort of before the, or just at the advent of modern medicine, where medicine was really based on, um, you know, different people's uh, folk understandings of, of what to use and how um, culturally specific um, ideas about health and healing would have been. All that stuff started to swirl together, and that's where the um, first chapter came from. That's incredible. Um, I love I love how much you just packed into that those few sentences. So many <laughs> different um, thoughts and and themes and contradictions and conflicts and um, it's really reflected for me in that that first chapter. Um, and before we leave the early part of the book, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about my favorite character, who was Ben Daisy. Uh -huh. um, and I just thought he was such an incredible character. Um, and he really turned out to be so different from who I thought he was gonna be. When, mm -hmm. when he's, you know, this, this sort of corpse that <laughs> comes back to life, um, I really wondered who he was gonna turn out to be. Was he gonna be scary? Was he gonna be threatening? Was he just gonna go on and be a regular guy? And um, he, he was so, so complex and so um, everything about him caught me off guard. Um, so I was wondering sort of how you how you developed his character, where he came from. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. That's a huge compliment. I think that's the biggest compliment a fiction writer could ever get is like a character surprised me. You know, that's, it's, it's the, it feels when you're writing, it feels so difficult to do. So thank you. I really um, take that to heart. Um, and the character of Ben Daisy sort of came from this idea of, I, I knew I wanted to write about this character, the um, Dr. Sampson, who's based on the first black female doctor in New York, in New York State. Um, but I wanted to figure out a way to humanize her story in the sense that to bring it sort of down into um, uh, everyday concepts. You know, when we talk about people who are the first in their field, um, it often sort of, uh, they immediately sort of go into the hero status and we don't really hear about the times that they uh, ran into complications or, or failed at something. So I knew I wanted in the, in the beginning of the book, I wanted um, Liberty, who, who is the narrator of this book throughout, I wanted Liberty to 
be at a point where she absolutely idolizes her mother because she's really young. She's only about, she's only supposed to be about seven or eight at the start of the book. Um, and I wanted the, the, the beginning part of the book to be her realizing sort of the limitations of, of her mother's role and what her mother can do. And so that's where the character of Ben Daisy came from. I tried to think of a character who um, Dr. Samson would be compelled to want to help and to heal, but who based on the um, levels of technology and understanding of health that she has at the time, which are cutting edge, um, she's she's not still not able to heal this person because Ben Daisy is um, somebody who's escaping from slavery. He's lived through um, incredibly traumatic event. Um, he's made it to freedom, but he's still dealing with what today we would recognize is still dealing with that trauma and trying to figure out what all this means. Um, but it's 1859, they don't have the, the words to really describe that state of mind, and they don't have a way to really explain and to contextualize what's happening for him. And so then the question becomes, what is this larger community of people going to do with a member of their community who um, is unwell and there's no real way to heal him? How are they, how is each member of the community going to react to that? Are they going to include him in the fold of the community? Are they going to shun him? What's going to sort of happen? Um, and that's the, the tension throughout that part of the book. <clears throat> so how did you um, sort of arrive at this um, place where he is, he's sort of ab absorbed into the community, as you said, and kind of accepted for who he is and just kind of allowed to kind of allowed to do his thing how what where did you get the idea that that would be sort of where he landed in that community I wanted to sort of um you know I one of the things that I was thinking about a lot too was like questions of how um people understood mental health issues throughout time and I was so struck by sort of like the history of that and how often um you know, before uh, sort of like the mid 19th century, before the rise of state institutions and, and mental health institutions and sort of like this big state apparatus of how to deal with mental health issues, oftentimes people were just dealing with people in their community who they knew needed more support or like had a problem, but they were still incorporated into that community one way or another, whether that was sort of like they were a family member who somebody decided we're gonna dedicate care to this person and they're gonna stay at home, or um, they were sort of incorporated into the larger life of a, of a neighborhood or a community, or even just into the folklore of the community. You know, that's that person over there who we all know does X and like we, they're, they're sort of like a, a, a mascot of our community. And I was really taken with that idea of, of um, how people dealt with people who are really struggling with mental health that didn't really have to do with this idea of um, shuttering them away from everybody. It was that they were still integrated in this community. They just were different. Um, and I wanted that to be the experience for Ben Daisy that, that this community is, is um, trying to sort of grapple with where and how this person um, fits in. And then, um, you know, later on in the book, there's another character, Ella, who's also having mental health issues and, and her community reacts in a slightly different way where they're they're just gonna pretend that it's not happening at all. Um, and so I, I really wanted to sort of explore those those different ways of, of reacting to that. And you, you touch on this a lot just in your last few comments. Um, I really, I felt that the book challenged my own biases that are based on being someone who's living, who's lived in the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century and I think about the mid 19th century, probably most of what I think about the mid 19th century was formed in Hollywood movies. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably a totally unrealistic image that comes to my mind. And I was reading it, I was thinking, so, you know, this really, the image that I have in my head probably is nothing like what the lived experience was. And I think that the way that you, um, the way that you write really, really brings that alive that that we don't, it would be really hard to, to put yourself into that world and to know exactly what people were thinking and doing and expecting and, and dressing like and, and all of that. Um, the other thing that I thought came across throughout the entire book was um, all these different roles that people are in. 
and either they're in these role, either they put themselves in that role, um, society puts them in that role, their family puts them in that role, and even no matter how hard they try to break out of that role, they may find themselves back in the path of least resistance. They might just go right back into that role without even really realizing that they're in that. And I mm -hmm. thought that came across so well in the relationships between Liberty and Mama and Emmanuel and the Graces and Ella um, and Emmanuel's father. There's all these roles and there, there's, there's the expected role based on society and there's sort of the, the role that they actually were living out. And so I thought that was um, really, really layered and, and rich and full of, um, full of different dynamics. Um, so I hope, wanted you to just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. sure. Thank you so much. I, when I think about the roles, like that's one of the things that really makes me both excited to study history and excited to write fiction. Like I'm always so interested in that tension between the roles that we think we're being expected to play and then our own individual desires or, or will and um, where those things align and where those things di diverge. And um, for each of the characters in the book, they, they have a real understanding of how the rest of the world is, they, each of them has a, an understanding of how they think the rest of the world is expecting them to act. And each of them has their own sort of internal life that's um, sometimes at odds with how they think the rest of the world is, is asking, is what they think the rest of the world is asking them to do. And one of the joys of writing the book was to write a um, Black female character who's living in, through Civil War and Reconstruction, who is primarily concerned with her own self-determination. Like, Liberty is in an extremely privileged position in a lot of ways. She's um, a freeborn Black woman at a time, it, born at a time when slavery was throughout the United States. It's, it ends during her lifetime, but she's born free. She's literate. She's um, educated. Her mother is um, educated as well. Her mother is a doctor. She lives in the North. Um, they have uh, a certain amount of disposable income. Like she has all these um, privileges which give her a certain role and certain expectations that she's expecting, but she still is, a, is her own person and she still is um, prioritizing figuring out what, what kind of person she wants to be. And it was really fun to write a character who was going to take herself and um, figuring out herself so um, seriously. Um, especially when she sort of in, inhabits a role that I think a lot of times people assume people didn't have any um, self-determination or agency in, um, but she definitely does. And she she takes the, all of that extremely seriously and is constantly striving to sort of figure that out about herself. Thank you. Um, can I jump in here really quickly, ladies, since we're we're towards the end. I'm sorry, Ramona, the dog has joined me. I have a couple of great questions in the chat for you, Caitlin. Um, we have from Jennifer, what kind of other historic research did you do to write Liberty? And then Lindsay asks, which of the characters you relate to the most? Oh, great question. So to the first one, um, the additional research that I did around Liberty, I, I read really widely about um, marriages in the mid 19th century among both free black people and enslaved black people. So there's um, uh, a really great historian named Tara Hunter who studies um, the history of marriage for uh, black people during reconstruction. And that was really eye-opening how um, important that institution was and how if you can think when people became free, one of the first ways that they interacted with the state as a free person and sort of made um, legal decisions was marriage, which is really interesting, um, especially in the 19th century when, um, you know, if you're looking at sort of like uh, uh, um, feminist definitions of what marriage was in the 19th century, it's like marriage was only about sort of property and, you know, like giving one woman to one family for another. Um, when you look at the history of of marriage within the Black community in this moment, marriage is a is a form of self determination. It's people saying this is our family, and for one and for the first time in our lives, the state is going to recognize, hopefully, recognize this family, and we have a family status, and this is actually freedom for us. And um, she just found these really sort of poignant um, notes that people would write 
in or, or ask the clerk to write into marriage certificates where they would note um, the spouses that they had, had had before who had been sold away from them so that that person would be in the record or they would say very clearly like I'm doing this of my own free will and marriage as this point of liberation is like a complete I think um, <clears throat> you know other alternative way to think about the institution I think than um, how usually I learned about it when I was sort of like in women's studies classes or something and like learning about the history of, of marriage in the western world that whole point of it was super interesting to me and became uh, uh, a point of um, research and um, imagination for the rest of the book. And then um, the character who I relate to the most, I think, um, is, I, that's a really good question. I think I, I relate to all of them so much. Um, uh, I think maybe, Emmanuel, just because Emmanuel is so idealistic and um, really just has a huge imagination for what's possible, um, but also feels like a very fierce loyalty to his family. And so I, I understand sort of both of those impulses, I think. Great. And then we have one more question, and then I think we'll throw it back to Dr. Anna and um, we're almost at the end of our time, but this is this is great. This is from Christine Grimaldi. Mm -hmm. who I met in the shop today. Mm -hmm. uh, she asks, one broad question, what similarities and differences exist in your approaches to writing fiction and nonfiction? And one hyper-specific question, did you study with the late Louise de Salvo, a favorite writer of mine at Hunter College? Hi. Um, oh, to that question, no, I didn't get to study with um, Louise de Salvo, sadly. Um, Hunter is super interesting because it had such a huge, wonderful, um, women writers of faculty um, for a long time. And then they sort of like what always happens in situations, they they created the MFA program and they just sort of like completely siloed students from the rest of that faculty. So um, it's sad the the people who sort of uh, miss out on, on getting to work with. So no, I did not get to work with, with that writer. Um, but uh, to the original question of, of the difference between fiction and nonfiction, um, I think with nonfiction, you know, it's always about building an argument, whether it's a personal essay or, um, you know, a, a reported piece, you're building to some sort of point or epiphany for a reader. And with fiction, um, you know, in, in something like a novel, if you try to really force those points, it doesn't really work. You have to really provide space for a, a reader to um, uh, bring their own imagination to the page. And it's, it's more of a conversation between you, your characters, and then the reader, whoever the reader is going to be, whatever they're going to sort of bring into their reading of it. Um, so you have to create um, and, and leave open spaces for the reader to sort of enter into the text on their own. And can, I'm sorry, can I say just one more thing? You don't have to answer these questions. I just want it on the recording. Okay. But, um, someone asked what research you did around reconstruction because she feels like it's something that Americans don't know much about. And then someone else asked what you have next in the fire, which I feel um, like you probably all want to know that. Yeah, sure. So very quickly um, around reconstruction, I, I was just so fascinated by um, the huge leaps and bounds that um, uh, free Black people were able to do during that period. So I read a lot about um, uh, free Black towns that were sort of set, townships that were set up during that time. Um, and then also I read a lot about um, uh, Black Americans understanding and um, interest in Haiti, which was super interesting. So um, starting in the 1880s and going up into um, the 19 teens when uh, U.S. government started decided to occupy Haiti. Sort of in that in between period of about thirty years, uh, black missionaries from the U.S. were super interested in going to Haiti, um, in uh, spreading um, Protestantism in Haiti, and just really fascinated with the country. And so that was the most interesting research was to read their letters and their sort of impressions about being there. And then. Um, what I'm doing next, that's a great question. So I, I'm working on a lot of short stories. I have a short story now out on, on Scribd um, that's completely different from Liberty. It's a um, story set in the present day. Um, it's set in Brooklyn, New York. It was really fun to write. Um, and I think I'm probably gonna do more um, short stories and, and nonfiction I do through um, my Substack. I have a Substack newsletter 
that hopefully will go out more now that um, uh, book promotion is winding down and stuff is getting quieter at day job. Um, hopefully more I get, I get to go back to sort of writing those things that I'm interested in on the Substack. I just want to ask Tara real quick or Anna how we're doing on time. Okay. We have just a few minutes left. Did you have some other questions up your sleeve, Anna? Well, I can if we have more time or if there's another question in the chat. I'm so sorry that we've got this time crunch. Um, that was my fault. We've got about four minutes left. I want to just quickly throw out, um, Caitlin, you may not know that Anna is Anna, daughter of a bishop as well. Oh, wow. I know. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and, and she's also a writer. So I would love to, I know you guys would have so much more to talk about, but go ahead. Do you have like a closing question, Anna? Well, um, I was thinking more just about Haiti, and I was curious as to whether you had been to Haiti, how much time you had spent there, and that's, it's a huge topic, clearly just the interesting history, and unfortunately, as we were getting ready to, to have this talk, so many um, difficult things have been happening there, so I was just curious about your relationship to Haiti. Yeah, my when I started writing, my relationship was nothing. I mean, and, and it's still a very slim personal relationship. I'm not Haitian. I don't speak um, Creole or French. Um, and I was able to go for about a week to do just some general um, traveling around the country when I was writing the book, um, but not really sort of deep um, research. Uh, but I did read a lot of um, Haitian novelists, Haitian fiction writers. Um, I read as much as I could about the history of the time period they were trying to write. And I spoke to a lot of Haitian scholars to try and figure out um, answers to these specific questions that I had. And um, one of the things that was really fun was to write about a country that I didn't really know that much about. Um, and to write about, again, and also about a time period in that country, which was a little bit lesser known because I could find a lot of information about the Haitian Revolution and I could find a lot of information about um, Haiti during U.S. occupation in the 19 um, teens and 20s, but I couldn't really find any a lot of information about this period in the 1870s when um, when liberty is going to be was going to be living in Haiti. Um, so it was sort of like a nice puzzle to try and get um, what information I could and. Haitian history is so fascinating, so rich and so dense. And um, there's so many amazing Haitian scholars who are just un uncovering, unearthing just more and more interesting stories. Um, it was really, really fun to get to work with all of that information. Awesome, thank you. I am so sorry that we have to wrap this up because I could listen to you for hours. Thank you so much. This book is, incredible it, it's really beautiful and it's full of just so much that i i'm gonna reread it oh, uh, at least nice. but it's beautiful and i just highly recommend it to everyone and and i'm so grateful to you for being here i'm so grateful to you anna for making Thank the time you. for your wonderful um observations uh, the the richness of this book all the textures and it's just yeah would love to hear more about it. But right now, I think we're going to get one. Our last, very last moment, someone asked Caitlin where they can follow you, where they can find you yeah. on social, where they can keep in touch. Um, I'm on Twitter currently, and the newsletter is probably the best place for finding stuff because I do also usually announce like when a, when a piece is coming or something like that. But Twitter and the, and the Substack are probably the easiest places. And thank you, Dr. Kaskin, for all of the amazing work that you do in the community and everything that you're doing for us. Thank you. And thank you, Caitlin. It was awesome thank meeting you. you and talking with you. Yeah, 100%. Thank you so much. I had such a fun time tonight. And thank you for hosting us. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a safe and healthy evening. Bye.